Welcome to the Friday Transportation Seminar at Portland State University. My name is uh, Chris Monsier. I'm a professor in uh, Civil and Environmental Engineering. And together with my colleagues, and today we have Dr. Lai Ming Wong from Urban Studies and Planning. We co-organized this seminar. Uh, we're very pleased today to have uh, Michael Olson um, from the School of Civil and Construction Engineering from Oregon State University. And he's going to talk to you about a really exciting topic today, LIDAR. So I'll turn it over to Mike. All right, thank you. And I'd just like to, to let you know, I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to come up here and speak. And if you have questions throughout the presentation, you know, we can, we can ask them as they come. I kind of do my presentation accordion style, and I can adapt to kind of the topics of more interest to you um, as we go through. So just a little bit of background about myself. Um, I've been here at Oregon State uh, for the last six years. Prior to that, I was down at UCSD. This is a picture of me in my natural habitat. I like to be out on the coast with a 3D laser scanner. That's my, my favorite place to be. Um, I did a uh, PhD at UC San Diego, and there basically my field office were the beaches of San Diego. So I spent a lot of time out on the coast. Some people say that really wasn't a PhD experience because um, you, you know, I wasn't there number crunching all the time. Although I tended to go back and forth between our Institution of Oceanography as well as our Computer Science Department and kind of link between those two different areas. Um, but my interests are in, in basically geomatics, uh, LIDAR, 3D laser scanning, uh, GIS, computer programming, and kind of tying all these, these different aspects together. And as you'll see in the presentation today, LIDAR is a very uh, interdisciplinary application. You can use this technology for quite a lot of different purposes. And so as we go through some of the examples that I'll show today with LIDAR, we're going to be going looking at very big objects down to very, very small objects and just kind of going back and forth between them. So we're going to be going all over the place, but kind of the point of that is, is you can use LIDAR for a lot of different technologies. Um, so just by raise of hands, who here knows what LIDAR is and has kind of worked with it before? Okay, so we've got some. Great. All right, before I get into that, I'd like to talk about kind of the area that I work in, which is, is geomatics. Who's ever heard of geomatics before? All right, usually a, a few less hands. All right. So geomatics is basically the science of measurements on the Earth's surface, uh, storing spatial data and so on. And we're very fortunate at Oregon State that we've been building up a geomatics program over the last several years. And as you can see, we've hired a lot of new faculty. Um, we just actually hired a new person on uh, Signed the Ink on Monday. So fresh news that uh, Dr. G. High Park is, is going to be joining us. Um, but we have a, a very growing um, program in geomatics within our civil engineering department, which is pretty much an endangered species at this point in the United States. It's kind of ironic. We depend on maps. We depend on spatial data more than ever. And yet the educational opportunities for training are lower than ever at this point. It's kind of an irony. So we're, we're excited to see that. And part of this is we formed a partnership with Leica Geosystems and David Evans and Associates. They're, David Evans is just actually down the street from you a little ways here. Um, and they've provided us with equipment and software to use in our courses. And so we have a wide range of, of research activities using GPS sensors, leveling, total stations, LIDAR scanners. And we do a lot of different types of applications in GIS, information modeling, property surveying, and LIDAR and SFM. And something's causing my slides to auto advance there, so hopefully that doesn't continue. <laughs> All right. So my talk today, kind of the bulk of the talk, is going to be about LIDAR technology. And the important thing is we're going to talk about a lot of different applications. The technology is a tool that can help in these applications, but the way to approach a project is not to say, I want to use LIDAR for something, to use LIDAR, because it looks cool. Um, you know, a lot of people kind of get excited about it. It's kind of a, the flashy. It's, it's, it's reaching the point, though, I think the hype, it, it's ended the hype spectrum and now into the, the real application. But really, the way to approach it is focus on what you need for your applications and then decide, is this the appropriate technology to support it? And one of the advantages with LIDAR is it supports a very wide range of, of activities. And so you can collect the data once and use it multiple times, as we'll talk about. So I'll talk a little bit about the technology, talk about how it works, um, as well as how it's used, and then talk a little bit of at the end about what's in store for the future of LIDAR. So the basics, LIDAR is, is light detection and ranging. It's an active system. Um, so it's actively emitting light. It's a little bit different than your uh, camera sensors where you're taking photographs with cameras. It's just using the ambient light to illuminate the scene. In LiDAR, you're actually sending out laser pulses. And I'm actually going to go to my next slide uh, to kind of discuss that. And so we shoot out these laser pulses. They reflect off of an object and then come back to the scanner. And then the scanner rotates about a 360-degree axis in the case of the terrestrial scanners we have here. And it's also moving up and down vertically as it scans. Now, these systems have evolved uh, to be much faster. So the initial terrestrial laser scans that came out in about 2000 was when they were first commercially available. Basically, you're collecting at a rate of 4,000 points per second. 
which compared to manually surveying something is pretty quick, right? So you're collecting a lot of information. Well, the current scanners that are out there now are at a million points per second. And so it's basically been in increasing at an exponential trend. So they're very, very fast. They capture a lot of dense data across the scene, and you see a lot of information. But it's really based off of this simple formula. You're calculating a distance based off of the speed of light and travel time to an object and back. And then you just keep track of the horizontal and vertical angle of where that laser's pointed at that time. Um, all right. So the, really the best way to learn about it, in uh, my spare time, I'm a rapper named M Slice, And so I put together a rap called LiDAR Rap. Unfortunately, I didn't get paid enough today to perform it here. You guys would have all had to pay $500 to get tickets to see me do it. No, just kidding. You guys, you guys would not want to see me do this. Um, but anyway, so here's kind of just a kind of basic premise of, of LiDAR. And if you, know, you want to get more information about it, it's basically a line of sight technique. So what you see is what you get. It's not going to scan through walls or see objects um, you know, that, that it can't physically see from that location. It's based off of the principles of time of flight. Um, just as we talked about earlier, how long does that light take to go to an object and come back? Um, there's a really good Magic School Bus video about LiDAR, and so th I think the presentation will be posted online so you can follow the link and watch that if you like learning from the Magic School Bus. They've broken it down and, and talked about it really well. But in the end, when we, we, we get our data out of the scanner, this is what we get, what we call a point cloud. And in this particular case, this is two different point clouds blended together, one from airborne laser scanning, which is probably what most people tend to be familiar with and have used. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the, the data that's been collected with those sensors for Oregon, uh, as well as terrestrial scanners. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about kind of the ups and downs of the different technologies today. Um, there's, there's advantages and why you would want to go with one over the other. In this case, the airborne scanner covers the beach really well. And never mind the fact that it looks like these, this is the water surface. It's just the fact the photograph was taken at high tide, the scan was done at low tide. And so the colors aren't quite true to it. But this is basically the beach surface. The terrestrial scan gets the cliff surface very well, because it's basically a vertical cliff. So the airplane can't really see that very well. And then the airborne catches the part up top. And so you know, as I talk about kind of these different applications of the different sensors, really the best is when you start merging these technologies together. So you use maybe the airborne for broader coverage, and then the terrestrial to come in for, for more detail. Now one of the things that I want to emphasize is a lot of people will refer to LIDAR as LIDAR imagery. And that term always just, I don't know, you just call me crazy, but it just kind of, it just doesn't sound right to me. Um, you can produce images from LIDAR data, but the reality is, is LIDAR is a 3D model. It's not an image like a photograph that you see. And so it's a 3D model that you can move around and navigate and look from all sorts of different viewpoints. And so it has a lot of advantages in basically things like virtual surveying, um, you know, where you can physically place yourself in, uh, in this, this 3D virtual world and look at objects from a perspective that would be unsafe or impossible to do in real life or infeasible. So right here, what you're seeing is a data set that we collected in Chile, uh, a town called De Chato. And this is after the earthquake and tsunami hit. And so we were able to go in and capture using terrestrial scanning several different buildings that were damaged as well as the areas where the buildings were lost. So now we've got very detailed topographic information we can have given those to people who do tsunami modeling so they can calibrate their models for predictive um, tsunami heights and inundation depths and so on. And so it's good data to kind of validate those models to say your model's predicting correctly or we need to fine tune these particular aspects. Uh, you'll notice that a car repeats every once in a while in there and the same car over and over again. And the reason for that is we actually ran out of battery power. So we had to run the scanner off the car battery and connect it. So we uh, kind of moved it along so it was in the way a little bit there. Uh, but just kind of gives you an idea of the density of the data. I like to refer to laser scanning as basically applied video gaming, um, you know, because you kind of get that feel of being in a video game. But these are, these are points uh, where the measurement accuracy can be at the millimeter or centimeter level, um, typically in, the, in the, the 3D laser scanning world. And so you have very accurate data that you can actually use for engineering type purposes. All right, so I'll continue on. So here's just an example of a street, um, just basically down close to the Oregon State University campus. But we can come in and virtually extract any measurement that we want. So really, the advantage is, is you know, a lot of times in, in engineering, we or even planning purposes, we send somebody out, and they go and collect measurements, and then we realize, oh, I really wanted a measurement for this, and then we got to go send them out again, and then we realize, oh, I need to get this information now, and we keep kind of sending them back out to the field. 
Laser scanning is kind of a way to capture that whole scene, so if you forgot something, you don't have to send somebody back out there. You can just come into the point cloud and extract it. So you can get things like lane widths. Um, you can see in this case, uh, you can see the lanes in the data. This is being colored based off of what's called intensity or a return signal strength. So bright objects reflect uh, stronger than you know, darker objects. And so the lane widths stand out really well in this scan data, and there's actually algorithms to go in and auto extract those, those lane widths and so on. Um, so anyway, you can kind of see the, the data that you get here. You'll notice that there's these streaks in the data. So this is one of the things, it's a line of sight technique. So if a car is passing or a bike's passing or a person's passing in the way, they're going to block the scanner and you won't get data behind that object. So we come in and we fill those in um, with a lot of different, um, different scan positions. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. All right, so here's kind of some of the basic products of, of what we get um, with the data. So we start out um, with the terrestrial scanners. We acquire a photograph at the same time um, that we capture the scan data. So we have photographic information. Here's the scan data uh, colored by intensity, as I, I just talked about in the previous slide. And most commonly, what we do with it is we go and digitize it into a vector so we can bring it into CAD. And that, that way, it then kind of plugs in with our current processes. Well, the problem with that is when we go from here to here, we've now thrown away about 99, you know, more than 99% of our data, that with information that's, that's there that's potentially useful in the design. And so a big part of the industry right now is trying to find ways to get um, the point cloud information into the hands of the designers and planners and other people that are going to use it so they can really start taking advantage of this wealth of information. The challenge is, is the data files tend to be very big and large and clunky to work with, and so unless you have uh, specialized software and unless you have a high-end computer, it becomes difficult to work with them in a lot of cases. Uh, but there have been a lot of progress in recent years in plugins for software like AutoCAD or MicroStation that you can actually bring your point clouds into there, um, into kind of that format where people are in their comfort zone. Sometimes we get a little more advanced and we create 3D mo models or 3D objects out of the data set. So here's an example in, in digital terrain modeling. So that's one of the um, key ingredients when we're doing an engineering design. In this case, this is Beverly Beach out on the coast. It's an actively eroding area of the coast. So we went out with, with static scanning. In this case, the model um, resolution is about five centimeters um, and what we created for each little triangle here. So you can create very detailed, smooth surfaces and really track how water flows across the surface, how the waves are undercutting here, and, and track those movements with time. And I'll talk a little bit about those. One of the key things that separates LiDAR from a lot of other technologies uh, in the fact that it's active is for every pulse you send out, you can sometimes get more than one data point in return with that. And so if you're thinking in the case of airborne laser scanning, you're up there, you emit one of these pulses, part of the light is going to hit the tops of the trees, it's going to hit some of the other branches, and then hopefully some of it's going to hit the ground before it reflects back to the scanner. So we send out our echo pulse. These are kind of intermittent echoes that come back from the tree, and then this is the final pulse from the ground. And at each one of these where we can detect the peak, we get what we call a return or an individual point. So we talked about sending out a million pulses per second, you can sometimes get more back than you know, a million points because some of these are reflecting off multiple objects. So in the past, we had what we called discrete returns. And so basically, each one of those uh, got digitized as one independent point. The newer systems are now actually providing that full waveform. And so this, there's a, a whole area of research in this and being able to identify objects based off of the shape of that light coming back. And so there's a lot of valuable information in there um, about the scene that, that's going on. So why is that important? Well, here's an aerial photograph of a river channel. And this is what we can see in the photograph. It's all masked by the trees. And a lot of our early digital elevation models are, are based off of photogrammetric scenes where most of our terrain and most of our ground is really in the shadow. So it's very hard to make a, a very detailed model from that. When we work with LiDAR data, because we have those multiple returns, we can go look at the lower returns or the last returns that hit, and we can then basically look through them and do statistical analysis to separate those points that represent the ground. So it lets us really see what's going on underneath the tree, underneath all the tree canopy, to much greater detail than we have before. So here we can kind of identify that, yeah, there's a road or something going through there just based off of the gap. Here we can really clearly dis distinguish that. We can also look at the river channel and get much more uh, details as far as the morphology and what's happening underneath there. And so that's uh, one of the, the most common things that the people are doing with the data. Now, we have to be careful because in the beginning, everybody was throwing away all the data from the trees, and then you know, they all wanted the bare earth models. 
And then people in forestry were saying, well, you're crazy. We could use this data in the trees. So usually one person's junk is another person's treasure, right? And that happens a lot in, in LIDAR data. Um, so, you, you know, it's important to, to keep that information that is available there. So are you guys familiar with Dogami, the Department of Geology and Mineral Industries? Um, they have their main office up here in Portland. So they do a lot of, uh, a lot of different types of hazard mapping uh, using, using LIDAR data. I'll talk a little bit more about their landslide program later. Uh, but this is an example of floodplain mapping that they've used LIDAR data for to get better ideas of what the inundation depths are going to be based off of uh, different frequency events, 100-year events, 500-year events, and so on. And so they can go through and do these details at much greater, um, or sorry, these scenarios at much greater detail than was previously possible. And then now that makes more informed decisions as far as planning. You know, do we continue to develop in this area or is this an area that is going to cost us a lot? In this case, we've already developed in this area. What can we do to make that community more resilient? What do we need to do to prevent these problems from happening um, to minimize losses in the future for risk management? This is all the, also another example of some work that they've done uh, looking at volcanoes and looking at lahar paths of uh, basically the, the lava traveling through and then figuring out, okay, what areas are likely in this path, how long before it's going to reach them, and, and so on, so you can develop emergency preparedness type systems. So those are a couple examples of some of the, the valuable things that are done with airborne LIDAR, and it is, is evolved into what we call the 3D elevation plan. And basically the 3D elevation plan is a national initiative that is um, basically uh, run by the USGS right now. They're kind of the lead um, behind it. And they went through and they looked at all the different um, applications of LIDAR that people were using publicly available LIDAR data for. And they found out that basically LIDAR produces about $690 um, $690 million annually in revenue in the pi private sector. And so basically when they look at the cost of what they spent on the LIDAR data versus what it yielded, it was a five to one investment. Anybody have a bank account doing that well or stocks doing that well? If so, you know, sign me up. You know, so it's, it's pretty phenomenal. I give you a dollar, I get five in return. And so they've realized you know, people would initially say LiDAR data, it's too expensive for my project. But in reality, when you look at all the benefits and all the cost savings and the efficiencies that are gained by it, in many cases, it's, it's something that's going to reduce those costs and give you a really good return on your investment. And so anyway, they go through and, and talk about that. They talk about the applications and saving lives based off of the hazard mapping, the risk mapping that can be done from it, um, the economic benefits, the environmental studies. Now we can really do things at, at higher detail and make better decisions to be better stewards of the environment. One of the big things that, that LIDAR has really helped with is collaboration within the government. You know, you've got all these different government agencies, different levels, federal, state, local, and really they, LIDAR has brought a lot of these different agencies together because now they said, well, it's a lot of money for us to collect data for this area, but this agency and this agency and this agency can also use it. So if we split the cost, it's not really that much of a cost for us to get the data. So a lot of them have pooled resources to, uh, to do that. Um, especially for national dis natural disasters, it's a great database uh, to really look at those potential, uh, um, potential impacts from that. So here's an example of, um, from the 3D elevation plan, although this is a couple years old, so it's a little bit outdated, but this is where LIDAR data is available on the country, uh, across the country. You know, some states like Iowa have completed the whole state. Well, it's pretty easy to scan Iowa, right, because there's not a lot of topographic variability. <laughs> Hopefully no one's from Iowa here, right? I do have a good friend from there, so i got to be careful. Um, but, you know, some of the, the Midwest states, uh, you can cover a lot of ground, and there's not a lot of uh, topographic variability that makes it very difficult for flights. Here in the Pacific Northwest, we're probably the most challenging area um, in the country, with the exception of Alaska, to really collect this type of data because we have such dense forests uh, that we really have to fly closer. We have to space our flight lines closer. We have to capture things at higher resolution. Um, fly lower and all these other things to collect the data. So you notice that we're colored orange. It's not because of OSU. I didn't purposely go in and change the color to be OSU, although maybe that's a reason why. But there's different quality levels that the LIDAR data is being collected to. And here in the Pacific Northwest, we have to collect a higher quality level in order to get uh, similar results as what you're going to get somewhere else in the country. Um, so that's, that's kind of the reason why you'll see that. So you notice uh, if we do a zoom in in Oregon, um, you'll notice this, this coverage is not the same. This map was created a couple years ago for the state, but LIDAR's data is being continuously updated and collected, so these static maps really become outdated the second that they're made. So here's an example of a more recent publication showing the status of, of collection here in the state of Oregon. Um, the next part that 
Dogami actually through this, this program, they're leading the Oregon LIDAR Consortium, they actually got the uh, contract to fly the Rogue Valley area, so they'll be able to fill in, in that gap there. And the goal really of the, the elevation plan is to get coverage across the whole entire United States um, throughout all the different areas. So basically when we look at the stats, uh, as far as when the report was published, about 28% of the U.S. has been covered at that point. Um, in Alaska, you know, they, they decided LIDAR is really not the right tool to try to cover it in Alaska because trying to fly planes and, and do it is just going to be very cost prohibitive and, and not the right place to do that. So we're going to use another technology called IFSAR. Um, but basically the, the rate of collection between 2009 and 2011 was about 4 to 5 percent. And now, you know, that's starting to increase as we've got more and more people in the market uh, that have this, this capability. And then the key is really the quality of the data varies between projects. So it's not enough for me to hand you a LiDAR data set for you to use. You've got to know how it was collected, what was done, what accuracy it was collected for, and what purpose it was collected for before you use it. You know, a lot of the airborne LiDAR data that's collected is great for planning purposes, it's great for scientific analysis, but most often it's not going to work for engineering uh, design purposes. We need a higher level of accuracy in, this, in the stuff that we do there generally. Uh, here's just another uh, map of what's available in the Oregon LiDAR Consortium. And um, so, so Dogami houses the data, and a couple years ago at Oregon State, we kind of uh, put together a contract with them where we would set up a LiDAR server that would have um, the LiDAR data on it available to students. Um, and so initially, you know, we were thinking of the, the OSU campus, but one of the things that we talked with Dogami is they say, well, we get a lot of uh, requests from PSU and U of O and so on. And so that server is open to anybody that's, that's interested in getting that LiDAR data. Um, it's up there. We don't really have a nice user interface for it. It's basically delivery disk, and you've got to go through and look at the indexing scheme and learn how to use it to get what you want. Um, but the advantage is it has all the data there. It basically has, you know, the, the bare earth models, the intensity maps. It has all the point cloud data there as well. And that was really the key. Um, you know, it's basically right now I think we're at about 35 to 40 terabytes of data on that server. And uh, there's millions of copies of it floating around the state on all these hard drives in different people's offices, but it's very hard to find a one-stop shop to get it. Um, and so this is, this is a great resource if you're interested. Uh, talk with me later. I'll show you how to get on. All right, so that's kind of a summary of some of the airborne coverage collection and, and so on and a few introductions to applications. Most of what I work in is terrestrial scanner, and this is a, a typical terrestrial scan setup. You mount it on the tripod just like a, a survey instrument, and... Um, you either have a computer to control it. The newer scanners tend to have onboard uh, controllers that you can control it directly on the system. Some even have an app on your phone you can control it on there. So what do you get out of it? So this is a point cloud with the photograph mapped over it. So you can see you can get a very high level of detail that it almost looks like a photograph with the exception of the artifacts of the, the black there. Um, those are areas we don't get data points in the sky because there's nothing for it to reflect off of. If we rotate the scans and we look at them from a different view, then we can kind of start to see, you know, a little bit of how the technology works. Here you see this kind of hexagon shape here. This is where the scanner is located at. And so underneath the scanner, it can't see below itself because there's a tripod in the bottom of the system blocking it. But you get very dense data and very dense coverage close to the scanner. But then you can see it starts to degrade and get sparser the farther out you go, um, especially on the flat terrain. And then it kind of picks up again when the objects are orth orthogonal to it. So we can take the scanners, we put them on tripods, we can also mount them to wagons. So when I was in San Diego, this is what we did, is we mounted to a wagon. Everybody on the beach said, well, you guys should go get an ATV. I said, yeah, we put in the request to our advisor about 300 times, he won't listen to us anymore. And then when I graduated is when they bought the ATV. So <laughs> it's usually the way it works. Um, but we can, we can coordinate it with GPS sensors and other technology in order to locate the scanner and give us more flexibility in, in referencing the data. Uh, and since 2009, mobile scanners have been developed. And so these are basically taking the setup similar to what you have on an airborne laser scanner, um, but combining it with some of the benefits that you get from a terrestrial laser scanner in the detail, but putting on a moving platform so you're correcting for that vehicle motion and when you're georeferencing your data. So you're able to get very detailed data driving the truck up and down the highway or the van or whatever object you have on there. So there's kind of some basic components. There's lots of different systems. Yeah, Chris? So you can drive at highway speeds, and so you can go anywhere from 20 miles an hour to 60 miles an hour. The accuracy of the data really doesn't vary depending on that, but what varies is the resolution. So the faster you drive, the farther your spacing is between your scan points that you have. 
and your scan lines. And so if you're in an area like a freeway where you're driving, um, you may get sample points uh, every 10 centimeters, you know, kind of a scan line that happens about there. Um, but what you can do to improve the resolution is just keep driving it and drive multiple lanes. And so that's often what they do. So it's, you know, you don't just usually, when you, when you talk about, I want to do an eight mile segment of highway, you're really talking about somewhere between 64 to 108 uh, miles of highway because you got to do each lane and you may do multiple passes and then you got to count for all the um, off ramps and on ramps and so on that you're doing there. Um, but the advantage is it's a much safer way than having somebody on the side of the road with a tripod as cars are whizzing past it, you know, 65, 70 miles an hour. Um, this way you're, you're kind of keeping up with the flow of traffic. And actually Oregon DOT um, has a mobile scanner that they use for asset management purposes and they have the advantage that they can actually do what's called a rolling slowdown. So they put uh, trucks behind to hold off the cars so they have access to the whole road and you don't get cars in your way um, causing obstructions. So sometimes when you're stuck in a big traffic jam, it might just be them doing their scanning and, and so on. Um, but anyway, the way these systems work is you have GPS to locate yourself um, as, as the trajectory is moving along, and then it has an inertial measurement unit that corrects for the roll pitch yaw of the vehicle. And these, these two systems work in concert to, um, to reference the, the laser scan data. So here's an example of, of mobile LIDAR data that was collected in Santa Ana, California. So it's very great for transportation type applications because you get the road and, and objects off the road very clearly. But you notice like areas where there's obstructions or you're blocked off the side streets um, behind, uh, you're not going to get, you're not going to get people's backyards and so on. So if you want to get those, you use airborne laser scanning to, to spy on your neighbors, right? No, I'm just kidding. Um, there's, there's ups and downs to the different technologies. So like I said, light, all LIDAR is not created equal, even with an airborne LIDAR. Um, airborne LIDAR, kind of just accuracy wise, you can get about um, RMS, about five centimeters accuracy under the ideal conditions. So this is, we're talking hard pavement, very clear view of the sky and so on. If you're talking about airborne LIDAR data in the forest, sometimes that can be a half a meter um, RMS accuracy or it could be about a, a meter accuracy. Uh, areas like swamps and other things like that where there's a lot of vegetation can really um, cause a lot of air in there. And so when you read the airborne LIDAR reports, they're going to you know, report the accuracy and they'll typically, if, if they've done a good job, they'll report what they call the fundamental vertical accuracy, which that's the best you have in the data set. And then there'll be other areas where maybe they've gone and done a validation in a specific area. So the important thing is to look at where they did the validation before you, you know how much you can trust that data set. So if they did all the validation in one area and your study area is over here, maybe they translate, maybe they don't. And so you might want to do your own validation to, to verify. But airborne systems, by the time that spot reaches the ground, the, um, the spot size can be anywhere from half a meter to about a meter in size. Um, so that footprint's covering a very large area when it's illuminating the scene. And so the return is really being averaged across that. Whereas mobile scanning, you're scanning a lot closer. And so as a result of that, your spot size is very small, typically a couple centimeters. So there's less positional uncertainty. Um, also, the other aspect with it, Though kind of the trade-off is you get very dense data close to your vehicle, but the farther away you get, the sparser the data gets, as well as you get data gaps and obstruction from objects that you can't see. Um, so if you have a wall, in the case of this example here, you can't capture this area behind the wall, so you've got to come in and supplement it with something else. Airborne laser scanning, you're going to see behind the wall, and you kind of get a very good plan view of the object, but when you start looking at steep cliff slopes, like in this example, you start to miss data in that particular area. So here's just kind of an example to illustrate that. Again, this is, this is back down in San Diego. The airborne LIDAR data, you can see there's less density to it. Um, there's a lot more spacing between the points, particularly on this, this steep cliff face. You're pretty much missing most of the cliff face there. Um, but with the terrestrial system, as you see in the top, you get very detailed there, data there, but you, you know, it's physically, you can go through and scan you know, all these areas up there to supplement it, but uh, it's very time prohibitive if you're planning to cover each a very large area to try to do that with a terrestrial scanner um, just because you have to physically move that object whereas an airplane you can fly through a lot quicker and capture the data. All right, processing. So basically everybody wants it to be you collect the data, push a button and you get your end result out, right? And uh, it's a very convoluted and very complex process to collect the data. Uh, there's a lot of different stages that, that we go through, a lot of planning that goes into it. 
you know, mobile scanning is, is a great way, a lot of efficiencies to collect the data, but it's not simply a matter of just going and driving and collecting the data and you've got what you want. Um, and it, it gets further compounded depending on how accurate you want the data, how much you have to invest in it. So this is just kind of an idea of all the, the different steps in the workflow and what has to happen. Um, I won't spend a lot of time talking about this because uh, we want to focus more on the applications. But one of the, the important things to consider is the data quality is heavily dependent upon where the sensor is positioned compared to your object of interest. So in this case, I've got a static scanner and I'm scanning the roadway surface. And the farther out I go, because scanners work on angular increments rather than distance increments, these scan points get spaced farther and farther apart. Also, the laser gets more and more oblique to the surface, so your data quality starts to degrade the further out you go. And so you'll, you'll see that a lot as you, as you work with scan data. So even though you know, I talked about some accuracy values earlier, they can widely vary across the scene. You know, part of it is sensor specific, but part of it is also how that laser is striking the surface. And so really every point has its own individual accuracy. All right, so we go out and we do a scan, and um, we can only see what we can, or we can only capture what we can see at that particular location. So here's an example of some sea cliffs. We capture the data, but we have all these different data gaps. And so really in all these applications that I'm going to show you, we go through and we move that scanner around to a lot of different locations in order to adequately capture the scene and merge them together to create a, a complete model. And there's lots of different approaches and techniques to do this um, in order to do the georeferencing process. Here's just an example of one that, that we commonly employ. Uh, this was down in Christchurch, New Zealand after the earthquake. There were several houses hit by rock falls, and this is an example of one that we were studying. Um, but typically, we'll set up the LiDAR scanner at various locations throughout to collect the data. We go and set up the GPS unit on control points in order to capture uh, centimeter level accurate data on, on those, those positions to reference it into the, the general network. Uh, and then we use a total station in order to shoot in these targets, as you see up in the top. So we put all these targets all across the scene, and then we can use those to link all these different scan positions together to, to um, basically produce a, a complete seamless model um, throughout the data set. And so I was actually teaching my GIS class about LiDAR this week, and somebody came up to me in afterward and said, well, I see all the students that are out there doing leveling surveys and total station surveys, and..." doing all that field work, LiDAR replaces all that so we don't have to do that anymore. And I said, no, that's far from the case um, because we really depend on these technologies to provide the control. It just minimizes the amount of work we have to do that was more tedious from the total station. And so we can kind of automate those processes. But really, the, the quality of the data, the accuracy of the data comes down to fundamental surveying principles and, and how well that control is established. So we can go through once we've collected the data, we've referenced it. There's a lot of... Um, there are some automated processing routines to extract certain objects from the data and simplify it. So we start out, we extract what we call geometric primitives or objects that we can put a mathematical equation to define, like a plane, a cylinder, and those types of things. Uh, there are some automated routines that will go through and search the point cloud for these types of objects to help turn them into kind of a solid model. So here's an example in industrial plant manufacturing. Uh, there's a lot of sophisticated algorithms to go through and detect where pipes are located. So a lot of industrial facilities will go through, run a point cloud, and use this to analyze really how their pipe system works. Because uh, a lot of things were built before people really had good digital plans of, of what those objects were. And so this is a way of kind of coming in and, and extracting that data um, more efficiently than somebody manually trying to go and sketch everything out. Uh, we can also do that with bridges, you know, with the columns. And, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about the geometric primitives in the previous slide, uh, but you can also fit things uh, like complex steel shapes, like W shape, H, um, you know, shapes, and so on. Um, there's libraries of those that you can fit against a catalog. If you have a defined shape, you can say, okay, try to fit this to this, and it will try to size it up, and so on. All right, so we'll talk about some example applications. Uh, so I'll first start with uh, transportation going to coastal erosion and landslides, and then we'll make our way down to cultural heritage and, and lab testing um, examples. So recently we were involved with a project uh, that was developing guidelines for the use of mobile LIDAR in transportation applications. Uh, got a lot of company logos and so on in here because it was a very interdisciplinary team uh, working on this, this project. And kind of one of the things that we were looking at is, is how LIDAR data is being used and could be used in, in transportation and some guidelines to help support that. And kind of what we, we put together is what we call the transportation asset life cycle. You know, we've, we've got a lot of infrastructure, a lot of resources that are out there, but we really don't have a lot of good uh, ways to maintain what's out there, to really know what's out there. 
And mobile LiDAR is, is, you know, I think one piece of the puzzle that's kind of that glue that holds all these other uh, different parts together. Um, but it's not the only technology out there. So the advantage to it is it can cover a lot of areas. It can probably get you 80% of the way that you need to. Um, but then you can come in and use that to kind of glue all the data you get from other sources together. And so recently there's been a big shift in transportation entities to really go to this geospatial framework of um, asset management rather than our paper-based things that get shoved away or some Excel spreadsheet on somebody's computer, starting to get into, okay, let's encode everything with a, a geospatial coordinate, and that's a link that kind of ties things together. Now we can start correlating between our different departments, you know, between the structural, the geotechnical, the hydro hydrological, the transportation safety. It's really a way to kind of get everybody to start talking, that glue to bring them together. Um, and then we, you know, we kind of move into, you know, projects. We have things like machine control and construction automation. I won't talk about those too much. But basically, LiDAR data is the source that you can use to develop input models that work for those types of systems. So um, as part of this project, we put together a website, uh, which is a great resource if you want to learn more about LiDAR and how it's being used, particularly within transportation, although it's not necessarily completely focused on transportation, but it's just simply learnmobilelidar.com. Um, so there's a lot of resources up there. First is literature. There's a lot of people using LiDAR in a lot of different communities, and so the information is very fragmented. So we try to put together a table that at least covers uh, transportation references. Um, I don't know the count on it. There's, there's tons of them in there, but you can search by keywords. So if you're looking at like street sign inventories, you just search for that, and you can read papers about how people have used it, look at reports on, on specific projects that have utilized it, and how well those have worked out. Uh, it also has a a map where you can come in and look and see which state DOTs have developed LiDAR specifications, uh, as well as other surveying type specifications uh, to get information on how that's collected. And um, then the next part that the website has is um, e-learning modules. So, you know, reading a report can get very boring very quick. And so this kind of takes a lot of the technical information and kind of breaks it down for an audience that isn't necessarily interested in understanding everything about the technology, but kind of the key components and the, the more important concepts. So this is an example of kind of an interactive module where you can click on one of those. It pops up and it talks about the tourism type application of LiDAR and how it was used. Um, it also has slides that talk about the technology growth. So this is the pulse rate with time. And notice this is a log plot. So it's really an exponential um, curve as we talked about earlier. Uh, it also has interactive quizzes. So you can go through and um, match the different components and what they do together. Um, kind of breaks it down in a non-threatening way. And then you've got somebody that's kind of your personal tour through it. And this is if you get the question wrong, she kind of shoots you a dirty look. But then if you get it right, she makes you feel really good. Um, so anyway, it's a, it's a good resource for kind of getting to, to know the basic concepts. Um, when we look at transportation in specific, there's a lot of applications of LIDAR in, in different kind of general divisions, maintenance, operations, planning, safety, and so on. And under each one of these, there's several different applications. And these are just a sampling of what's out there. So there's a lot you can do with it. Um, and so you know, things like uh, land use zoning, traffic congestion, parking utilization is one of the um, interesting studies that we came across in this, bridge information modeling, clearances, uh, drainage networks, bridge inspections, roadway analysis, coastal erosion, inventory mapping, uh, feature extraction, and so on. And there's all these different accuracies and ways people are using the data. But one of the challenges is, if I'm using data for planning, I don't need everything to be down to engineering grade accuracies, right? I just need to have a general idea of where things are located. So I don't need to pay for that higher quality data. And I can get that data a lot cheaper. Now, if I'm trying to use this data that was maybe collected over here, that was collected for planning for engineering, there can be a lot of problems. Um, so what we did is we tried to look at all these different applications and kind of see which ones fit together based off of their accuracy and resolution needs. So in this axis, you have their accuracy of the data, uh, the 3D accuracy. In this axis, you have point density, uh, so or that resolution that you're sampling at. And those are kind of the, the two things that you can control. And so the, the higher accuracy requirements you know, are up there at the top left. Well, the question is, is why don't we just collect everything up there at the highest level of accuracy that we possibly can in resolution? That way it works for everything. Well, the reason for that is every time you start stepping up this direction and every time you start going from this way, it's orders of magnitudes increase in cost and time that have to produce it. To collect a point cloud where things are generally located, relative accuracy is pretty good between the objects among themselves, it's fairly inexpensive to do that. You just do one pass with the vehicle and, and you're good to go. 
Whereas if you want to get down to engineering grade data out of, the, out of the systems, you have to set a lot of survey control and you have to do a lot of post-processing techniques to make that happen. And so it takes a lot longer to do. You know, here you can run and collect the data along a segment, say in a day, to do that same area there. It could take weeks or months uh, to get that higher level of accuracy. And so that's, that's one of the, the reasons why you want to kind of figure out what level of accuracy do I need? Who else is potentially going to need this? And does it make sense to step up a little bit to support those? Or is it going to be cost prohibitive? All right, so we got the money. That's, that's kind of the reason why. So just kind of to visually show you some of those examples that we talked about, um, one of the things we talked about was LIDAR has intensity measurements, so you can extract objects in the scene based off of that return signal strength. So things like street signs are reflective, right? That's part of uh, the safety aspect of them, so they're easy to see. And so we can just simply query by intensity and then figure out where these objects are and then do some shape fitting to say, okay, these are stop signs, these are parking signs, and so on um, against these, these template databases. And one of the kind of the anecdotal stories that goes around a lot uh, when people talk about LIDAR um, is there are cities that go in and they know they're responsible for maintaining their street signs and so on, but they really have no idea how many they have because things have kind of been done under maintenance, nobody's really kept track of what's been changed, what's there, and so on. And so there's an example of a city that basically they thought they had about five to 10,000 street signs uh, that they were responsible for maintaining. And then when they went and through and did a mobile LIDAR pass and extracted all the street signs, they found out it was somewhere more like three, or sorry, 30,000 street signs that they were responsible to maintain. So kind of a big wake-up call in your budget cycle, right, of, okay, our street replacement costs are going to be much more. Now, at that point is kind of that initial shock, but now they have numbers to work with that are more accurate, and in the end, that helps them plan better how they utilize their resources. Uh, bridge clearances, that's another big area. You know, there's a lot of push for less and less clearance as uh, trucks speed down the highway going, you know, 65, 70 miles an hour underneath the bridge. Now the current standard is three inches, which is pretty small. And so you can extract those from, from mobile LiDAR data, and the value is now instead of somebody manually doing it and only checking a couple spots on the road, you can do it across the whole bridge and really find what that minimum clearance is and will it make it. And there are examples, if you talk to Ron Singh at Oregon DOT, they've used this quite a bit. There are examples where they have big boats that they need to take through tunnels, and I mean, they literally just have a couple of inches on the side, and so they can go through and, and do those types of analyses. I won't show the, the video on this, but if you go to YouTube, there's a, a video. This was work done by David Evans and Associates with their mobile scanner. And so basically what they did is they collected the point cloud data in LA um, where the space shuttle Endeavor was going to be taken from the airport to its kind of final resting place. So here it had to pass through the city streets, so they had to know which streets can we actually take this through and what objects are going to conflict and get in the way. The last thing you want to do is park this, you know, the space shuttle right in the middle of a major intersection in LA and realize, you know what, we thought it would fit, but it didn't fit. So they built, developed a digital model. They could come through, find out areas where vegetation conflicted, uh, where power poles conflicted, and where things needed to be removed. And so as a result, it was a very coordinated effort. They knew which things they needed to take down, and they could you know, stage it, and were able to get it there in about three to four hours with, with no problems whatsoever. And so that's, that's one of the kind of examples of obstruction and clash detection you can do. Uh, you can look at pavement cracking and rutting uh, with the detail and really track those with time and figure out what those running depths are and so on. Um, here's an example where you can see the, the rut forming in the road here in the lane. These ones are scans that we did, and right after we did the scans, and I kind of started showing these as examples, they went and repaved the road, so I don't know if that was connected or not. But Sometimes you may get immediate results with that. Uh, here's a project we're doing up in Alaska. This is an uh, area of highway called Glitter Gulch right by Denali National Park. And so the idea is to really integrate the, the LIDAR with the, the slope characterization in the geology world, and then from there be able to determine which areas are the highest risk. So they can then decide, okay, these are the areas we want to spend to stabilize our slopes because this is going to have the highest impact. Because, um, you know, especially as budget cuts have happened, we only have so much limited resources, we have to kind of figure out where are the best spots to put those um, to reduce risk and, and other factors to get the best benefit. And so when we take it, we can come through and we can calculate based off of some sort of risk metric you know, these areas are the areas that are at highest risk here, whereas these areas in green um, have less of a problem. All right, I'm going to skip over this one real quick, uh, but sea cliff erosion, I'll, I'll jump here. This is the, the Johnson Creek landslide out on the Oregon coast, just north of Newport. If you ever drive there, there's an area where there's fresh pavement. Basically, ODOT has to pave it about twice a year uh, because it's an active landslide. It's moving about 10 centimeters a year at the south end. 
So it's moving very rapidly. So we were able to go down. Uh, if you go down to the, the bluff face, so the, the face of the landslide, um, where things are getting eaten up by waves and you have precipitation runoff, we can go through and track change. So areas in, in orange mean that the waves are eating up the cliff faster than the landslide is moving. And areas in blue means the landslide is moving faster than the waves are eating up those sections. But we can get very detailed estimates of how things are changing um, in these very complex systems uh, that are going on. Uh, we also developed a, a system where we could uh, do that change analysis in the field. And so there's just kind of an example of the, the program for that, but I'll skip that to move on. Uh, landslide mapping, so, so Dogami is, is basically recognized as a national leader in uh, landslide mapping. And so one of the advantages to LIDAR data is you're, very able, you're able to very clearly see within the data fault scarps and um, alluvial fans and other types of things in the data at a much higher degree of accuracy than we could previously. And so they're very actively pursuing an initiative to, to map the state with, um, with using LIDAR data to map all the landslides in the states. And basically what they're finding is in a lot of areas, um, it can range from about 50% of the, the area to 80% of the area is covered in landslides. Whereas before they maybe only were able to map about 10 to 20% of the area um, just due to the, the poor quality of the data. And so when we look at like our coast range of Oregon, we're littered with landslides and a lot of problems within there. And so this gives us a better picture of, of where these landslides are located and helps us with the, the planning purposes. Um, so here's just an example of zooming in on one of them. Here you can clearly see the fault scarp where the materials fell and moved here down slope and so on. And we can go through and digitize contours from that and then basically track connections between those and then track where um, soil paths are going to be um, and then so on. And then this is you know, the example of taking that and putting it into a polygon. I do a lot of work in, in post-earthquake deformation. So after earthquakes and tsunamis and other types of hazards happen, we can go in and we can take the scanner down there, capture structures, and look at the deformations on the structures and compare those to what we would expect using our structural models, our finite element simulations. Here's just an example of some of the applications. Um, I won't spend too much time on those because we are running a little low and I want to leave some time for, for questions. Uh, but here's an example of a concrete wall uh, that had felled, and these are the deformations from a planar surface. So we can compare these, which are the actual field data, to what our model's predicting. So we can get an idea, are we in the right range? Are we predicting that these things are happening at the, the same location? Here you notice the centroid of impact is a lot lower. And the reason for that is when our equations, we assume a constant seawater density, but in reality, the tsunami, there's denser material at the bottom with all the debris compared to up at the top. So we can kind of check those. Uh, here's just an example of a house in New Zealand hit by rock falls. So we're able to, to take the airborne LIDAR data to figure out where the source of the rock fall was and its travel path and what velocity it hit the house with and if there's um, what we could do to prevent uh, that from happening in the future. You know, really, the, the key value in, in this particular type of application is the fact that you digitally preserve the scene. You know, when you have a major disaster, a major earthquake that happens, as part of the recovery, you need to get in there quick and, and rebuild, right? And so that means getting rid of a lot of the debris and other materials. And so this is very perishable data. And so we're able to go and preserve it digitally so scientists can continue to come back to the site and explore. It also makes it so that somebody can virtually do the reconnaissance work if they need to get pieces of information without having to actually travel to the site because you don't want to influx these areas that have been hit with lots of people um, after the events. Uh, tourism and uh, basically virtual tourism. So this is Balboa Park in San Diego. We did some scanning along there. Uh, one of the main purposes of this was to figure out where the best spot to put Wi-Fi towers were. And so using the 3D model, you could figure if I position the Wi-Fi tower here, how far is the signal going to travel before it hits these obstructions and so on. Um, here's an example of a project. Uh, anybody a Da Vinci Code fan in here? All right. So. So just to kind of show you the range, and we've talked a lot about science and engineering and, and planning applications, but LIDAR is also very big in the cultural heritage um, aspect of it. So this is a project that we worked on at the Palazzo Vecchio in Florence, Italy. Uh, this is a laser scan of what's called the Hall of the 500. It's the inside of the hall, but we're looking at it from an outside perspective. Uh, so we can zoom in. Here's a, a photograph by Dave Yoder at National Geographic. Um, they haven't released the full res versions, and I've been waiting eight years now to get those, uh, but they want to wait before they find it. But basically, the premise of the project is it's believed that one of da Vinci's uh, most famous paintings, the Battle of Anghiari, is behind that wall right there. And we've gone in with radar scans, and there's a one-inch, constant one-inch gap there. 
Um, that basically indicates that there's, there's some sort of secret compartment that he built, which he's the, uh, been known to do. And so that's, that's kind of the, the big question there. So part of the project was to do the scanning to really tie all these other different data sources together. Um, National Geographic has a couple things online about it, but they're kind of waiting to, to do that. So here's just an example of the point cloud um, in there. You know, one of the fun things in there is they have these huge murals. This one's probably about 10 meters across. And way up here, there's a little tiny soldier that has a flag that says Serka Trova, and it's the only text on the hallway. And Serka Trova basically means seeking you shall find. And so there's kind of this, this interesting Da Vinci reference being put there. So it's a project that, you know, it's been, been going on for about 50 years in total. Um, since Mauricio Serticini, he's kind of the main guy in charge. He's been looking for it for a very long time. Um, and so we're hopefully a little bit closer. All right, so we can go, you know, very large scales to very landscapes. We looked at kind of building scales. We can also use it for very detailed analysis. This is a structural test specimen. You can see the rebar here. In this case, we sampled the surface at one meter, or sorry, one millimeter resolution. So you can see very detailed uh, effects on the concrete spalling, the cracking that form, and, and basically track those through the surface. We can also zoom down and use systems that are capable of scanning at micron level resolution. So very, very high precision data. These are composite materials that they use to um, basically build lightweight bridges uh, to drive tanks over. So you need something that's very lightweight, easy to deploy, but high strain. So basically, depending on the orientation of these carbon fiber meshes makes a difference in the strength capacity and so on. So these are probably less than a millimeter thick in size, just to give you an idea of scale. And then this is probably about um, six to eight centimeters in, in height here. So you can get very high, highly detailed with specific types of systems. So the, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of different ways that, that things can be um, looked at with LiDAR data, depending on what type of sensor you're using. Uh, so some kind of conclusion things about the value of LiDAR data. It's a very fast, efficient, and safe way to survey. It gets a lot of people to get the data quickly, um, but then do a lot more of the work in the processing in the office so that you're not under dangerous field conditions. You know, I think one of the most critical things about it is you can look at data across a wide variety of scales. So for example, here we've scanned a very large section of the cliff. We can look at the overall process of what's going on along that entire corridor. And we can also come in and zoom in really close and see the, the smaller processes that are going on on individual rocks that are moving and track those. And so it supports a lot of, of research and analysis at a wide variety of, of scales, depending on what your interest is um, within one data set. A uh, lot more um, improved quantification of damage. Uh, it really helps us validate a lot of our science models. It can be used in, in, by engineers and planners to, to make better decisions and be informed. Um, and, you know, I think the key value is it digitally preserves that virtually so you can use it again and again and again by a lot of different people. So what's going to happen in the future? Well, I already talked about the speeds of the scanners going from 4,000 points to a second to a million points per second. And the trend hasn't shown any signs of slowing down. Physically, I feel like it's got to reach a point where you just can't do it any faster. Um, but they, they keep um, breaking some barriers there. So we'll, we'll see how that kind of continues to go. Um, but there's a lot of improvements in, um, for example, technology called flash LIDAR. And so right now, laser LIDAR works by sending out individual pulses one at a time. Flash LIDAR is basically like taking a picture, but a LIDAR picture. So you send out this array of pulses at a time. And, and seamlessly integrate those together. And so that's a, um, the first commercial systems are now coming online. And so I think we're going to see that, um, that changing. I think, you know, within the, the context of civil engineering and planning, it's really going to take us out of the, the paper-based 2D design processes, plan and profile, into really a truly digital 3D world. And I think it's really going to help us bring our data and kind of integrate it all together. LiDAR is not the only technology that can do this. There's things like structure from motion, where you reconstruct 3D models from 2D photographs. Um, there's also technology called simultaneous location and mapping. And these are kind of, you think of robots that go through and they're trying to figure out where they're located in a scene at the same time they're creating a map of that scene. Um, so there's some very advanced technologies that are happening. We'll see improved coverage across the country through the 3D elevation plan. Uh, there's also handheld scanner units that people can just walk through with that basically looks like a bobblehead bouncing back and forth to scan inside and outside of buildings. So I think it's, it's kind of going to be that glue that holds a lot of things together. And, you know, the beginning, most of you said yeah, you know, that you weren't too familiar with LiDAR. Um, there are a few of you that mentioned that you had. Um, but pretty much anybody who's used Google Street View, they're going through and they're collecting LiDAR data. They're not providing you with that data, but anytime you click somewhere in their, in their view, it's sending you, it's basically sending a, that back to their, their main processor 
looking at the LIDAR data to figure out which picture is the next one to, to send you to. And so there's, there's a lot of kind of behind the scenes stuff that's happening with it. Um, but yeah, real quick, so this obviously presented a lot of results from a lot of different types of projects since there are a lot of different people and agencies involved in these um, that deserve acknowledgement. I put this in at the end if you're um, interested in learning more. Uh, the e-learning website, there's a link to that. There's also a website, LiDARnews.com, and that's basically kind of the main industry site where people release a new system. Uh, you'll hear about it there. You'll hear about different ways people are using it for various applications. And so with that, I'll open it to questions. These uh, represent the wisdom that I encounter as I interact with people while doing field work, uh, especially in the beaches of San Diego. There's kind of some interesting questions that we get. So I'll let you chew on those while I answer some questions. Yeah? Uh, considering the application, I guess, seems right to pair with drone technology, what do you think the timeline is on getting more like that? So there are already systems that um, have been developed to put uh, LiDAR sensors on there. For example, a company called Velody makes what they call the puck sensor. Um, that's lightweight enough to put on drones. So there are people that are starting to fly it. The big challenge is technically drones are not legal to fly right now unless you're doing it for the pure joy of flying. Um, there are some companies that have kind of found ways around it a little bit. Um, the FAA recently re released some announcements about it and um, it'll probably be about another year, year and a half before people in the commercial sector can really start working with it. Um, we've got some research groups at Oregon State that are using um, structure from motion, so cameras mounted on drones to capture um, point cloud data. And we're in the process of purchasing basically a, a LiDAR unit to mount on it. Um, but a lot of the, the drone systems, you have to have one of the bigger ones to be able to handle that weight and that payload. Um, so I see a huge potential in there, you know, as that, that technology evolves. Yeah. I have a question. Um, a couple of times you've distinguished uh, resolution and accuracy, uh -huh. specifically with the speed. So you were saying the distance between points increases mm -hmm. that with resolution. How does that relate to the angular increment that you were discussing? Because you said the distance increases and, the, and that affects quality. Yeah. Is resolution or is there like a signal strength problem as it gets further away? So there's, there's a couple things that happen. Very good question. So basically when we talk about the quality of data, Accuracy is one thing that people go to, and that's, you know, how, how close to the true value did I measure this point's, you know, coordinates in, in real 3D space. Resolution would be, well, how many points did I sample along this object, so how far apart are those spaced? And so with the, the scanners, um, when, you, when you talk about resolution, you get very high resolution close to the scanner because when it's judging what to do for a scan line, it's spacing those based off of an angular increment um, because it's basically a sensor around a fixed axis and it doesn't know how far the object is that you're scanning. So it spaces those at an increment, say 0.01 degrees or something on that order. And so the farther away you are from that object, the less sample points you're going to have. So if I have a wall that's really close to me, those angular increments are going to be, or the angular increment is going to be the same, but the, the spatial increment is going to be very small. But the farther that wall moves, or the farther I move from it, the farther those are going to be spaced, unless I set another angular increment with the scanner. Um, so that, that's one thing that causes it to degrade. Um, that doesn't degrade the accuracy necessarily so much, although there is a range dependent on accuracy. Um, but basically, what it does degrade is, is how far those points are spaced apart. What degrades the accuracy is if I'm scanning and I want to scan this wall, if I'm really close here, I'm nice and orthogonal right here so I get good data, but here I start to get more oblique. And so I think it's shining a flashlight on the wall. If I shine it close here, I get a nice circular spot. But if I shine it over here, it starts to bleed across the surface. And so now the laser, when it's determining range, it's determining it based off of how that spot strikes it. So here it's pretty well defined and contained, but there it starts to bleed across the surface. And so you get a lot of impacts with that. So where you position it makes a huge difference in both of those aspects, and they're, they're two different parameters. Does that answer your question? It's in short nutshell. There's, <laughs> there's a lot there, you know, resolution, accuracy, and um, precision. They're, they're all different terms that I think get mixed together a lot when they're really three distinct things. Uh, there is a module on that Learn Mobile LiDAR site that kind of walks through it and uses the bullseye target classic example to explain it. Any other questions? Yeah? Yeah, it seems like cost for the most part was the biggest limitation in implementing LiDAR, mm -hmm. uh, whether on the small scale or large scale. So what kind of time frame do you see for decreasing LiDAR cost enough to where it gets implemented more and more? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. You know, the early days, you the systems were very expensive, um, and it, it kind of quickly reached a plateau point. 
And at this point, there are very few systems that are mass produced. So if I want to order a LiDAR scanner, I go and talk to the company, and then that's when they actually build the unit they're going to sell me. Because if they leave that unit on the shelf, you know, they'll maybe make a quota for the year based off of the ones they know they can sell. But if they have a bunch sitting on the shelf, it's obsolete technology, and they're already moving on to the next version. And so the cost of the systems really haven't gone down too much. Um, for the most part, because there's, there's still a lot of R&D, there's still a lot of development going, and so once, you know, they produce one line of systems, they're already working on the next model and basically phasing that previous one out. Um, that being said, the, the big thing that determines the cost, at least on terrestrial systems, is range, and so the, the cost can vary from about $40,000 for very close range scanners, where maybe you can get about 30 to 40 meters away, um, and then if you want a system that can go, say, 300 meters away, um, that one will usually run you about $100,000, and then if you want something that the farthest terrestrial system out there right now is uh, about six kilometers, and those ones run about $400,000. So there's, there's kind of a polynomial curve. I actually went through and plotted it up, but I didn't include this, this slide um, in cost for those terrestrial systems. The airborne systems have pretty much remained constant at a million dollars um, to, to purchase, but the cost of services, I think, has gone down as, as far as LIDAR has improved. So if you wanted to buy the sensor, those costs stayed pretty fixed, but now there's more people out there doing it, the, um, and there's a lot more people willing to share the cost, and so it, it really becomes very inexpensive very quick as far as that. So there's kind of some complexities there, but that, that's kind of the gist of it. Uh -huh. Other questions? Yeah, I think we're, we're at time, so okay. I think Professor Olson might stick around to answer a few questions. But before we give him a round of applause to thank him for this, interesting presentation today. Next week, our, our topic is uh, development of a pedestrian demand estimation tool, a destination choice model by Chris Moos. Uh, he's a PhD student here at PSU. So thanks, uh, Mike. Great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, if you have any questions, I'll, I'll stick around for a little while. So.